one third of Canadian mortgage holders have amortizations over 30 years. How does this end? The, the renewal crisis. Welcome to the Tom Story Show with Steve Karish and Tom Story, where we discuss everything real estate or whatever else is on our minds. I'll do the intro and then we'll just have some fun. Cool. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Tom Story Show. This is your Sunday weekly real estate roundup podcast, and I want to thank you for being here. The YouTube channel has continued to grow. We are getting to that 2,000 subscriber mark, which we are very, very excited about because this thing is still just in its infancy. We are less than a year old, and we're trying to build this as fast as we possibly can. So if you're coming back week after week, we appreciate you. Please make sure to subscribe and like this video on YouTube as well. On the audio platforms, those numbers continue to build on a weekly basis, which we love to see. So if you're listening, just want to say thank you. And if you haven't already, make sure to go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review if you're enjoying the show. On to this week's guest. Okay, so this is a really, really cool guest we've got here, guys. And this is why it's so cool. You look at, you know, the Mount Rushmore of Canadian real estate podcasts, right? Uh, Tom Story Show maybe hasn't made it there yet, but we're, we're working our way up, right? But then you've got the Looney Hour, right? We've had Soretsky on the show. And then you got the Canadian real estate investor. We've had Foch on the show. But then the guys who started it first, the Canadian real estate show, co-host of the show, TK Butler has joined us, also active real estate agent with Remax West. TK, welcome to the show. What an intro, Tom. Holy smokes. <laughs> Can I get the recording of that? Yeah, now that was on the spot. Of, that was on the spot. I just that yeah? just came to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I I hope so. I hope so. That was really good. And I know you're you're talented. I figured what we do first is just get like a really good uh, soundbite. You know, just so you know when you guys are going to promote this, I think that's really important, right? So you Say know your editing crazy. department, you know, in Pakistan, they can uh, you know put this on your front ads, and that way when people are going to be out there, okay. Okay. Guys, the market is crazy. It's insane. I've never seen anything like this before. Everybody needs to be so careful right now before they do anything in real estate. This guy knows how podcast works. Look at that. Okay. Right, right. <laughs> I think that's it. I think we're wrapped up. Thanks we're for just, coming. We're done. Yeah. That's it. There you go. There's all your views, right? Um, so. so TK, um, to the viewers that don't know who you are, can you give us a bit of a background? Because for people on YouTube, they know you as the co-host of the Canadian Real Estate Show. Obviously, your clients know you as a real estate broker with the Frank Leo team and Remax West. But how long have you been in real estate? What markets do you service? Like, give us a bit more of like you actually, not just the online persona, but like who are you? You know, when you're not uh, making podcasts. So it's like it's such an interesting way that you worded that too, right? It's like. Who the heck knows me as the co-host of the Canadian Real Estate Show? Like a lot of people. Like 90, but ninety-nine percent of my life doesn't, right? Yeah. It's just like you know, like you know, your clients, your family, your friends, the people. Like it's just it. It is a small part, but when the internet's involved, everything so seems so huge. It's, yeah. It's right. It, it feels like it's just so massive, right? That like you are that guy. But I mean, to, you know, you guys as well. Like you have such big lives outside of this show and your channels and all those things, and it's 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 a small part, right? But I'm I'm happy to even have that um, message out there. Is that you know I've got a podcast and that we're doing it and it's successful. I guess I don't know how you measure success, but people watch it and I love doing it. So we're just going to keep doing it. You know, like that's I'll I, I'll tell you how you measure success because when you guys used to do it just on video and would take forever to put it on audio, Steve would complain to me, being like, "I want to listen to their show in the car, but I can't get it on audio yet." But now you guys are on both platforms, correct? Yeah, we're on all the podcast platforms and then obviously YouTube and everything else. And both of them are pretty, you know, well listened to. And again, you know, it's just something that we do. We do. I think you have to love it. Yeah. If you don't love it and you're not enjoying what you're doing every single week, how many okay, go on podcasts, whoever's listening right now, go on to Spotify and type in real estate podcast yeah. and then go and click on a bunch of different ones. And you'll see like four or five, six episodes from like 2019 or They've like given up. maybe like two at like March 2020 till June 2020 and then they just stop right I've always said uh if you want to be successful in anything in life that comes down to three characteristics you have to have patience right you have to have the execution of actually doing it so those are the first two and so you guys have had the execution of doing it every single week having an idea you've had the patience to watch it actually grow right and Steve can you guess what the third one is uh, I can guess what the third one is. I'm assuming you're going to say consistency. It's consistency. Hey, 
<laughs> you guys are consistent. You actually have done it time and time again. And you're absolutely right. Like when I talked at the beginning of the show of the other Canadian real estate podcasts I know of, it's because they're not six episodes and out. They're 50, 100, 200 in, and they've continued to go. And you guys have, I give you a lot of props on that because you've, you guys were the first to it realistically. You, you started early pandemic and just kept rolling with it, correct? Yeah, we're either incredibly, um, tenacious or stupid one of the two <laughs> but along the way there was like you know this is not going well that show sucked that guest was horrible oh my gosh we had to delete one episode one time or edit it out some things like there's been all sorts of stuff and you kind of like are thinking to yourself like you know why are we still doing this but then there's like these great episodes that come out of it and i learn so much from the guests or i even learn from my own research or from daryl you two get you know you guys are two you know popular guests that we both have uh, on the show a couple times so it's like you, you learn all this stuff and then you use that in my job what really matters the the yeah. place that i you know <laughs> support make a living yeah. on and make a living so then you're like yeah that podcast is really helping me because of because of those things alone and um, it makes it all worthwhile at the end of the day, which is why we're all doing this, right? So we had your co-host, Daryl, on the show, and he, he came and brought it. It was a great episode. Um, how do you know Daryl? I never asked you guys that. How do you guys know each other? Well, we have like so many fake stories where we're like, okay, you know, like you saved me from like a burning building and you, you know, you brought me into this. It was just like we, we met through friends years ago, 2016. And then it was just like we were just like, acquaintances, you know, like it wasn't anything big. And then we started talking a little bit real estate, I think first, but the actual thing was he needed a hockey. So he, Daryl's daughter plays hockey. She's mm. a goalie. And Daryl was like, I'm going to play goalie because it looks easy. And he was in his forties at the time. Okay. And so <laughs> <laughs> I felt sorry for him hearing about it, but anyways, he was actually pretty decent. And, uh, so he said like, we need hockey players and, and all the people we were with, like none of them were hockey players and, and stuff. So, and I was like, well, I play hockey and I went and played like in the far West end. I live in the East end. It was not enjoyable whatsoever, but I just, I just did it. So then we were in contact with each other more and, uh, and then it was just like all real estate related. So it was just like, we started talking. He actually had a connection at my brokerage. So that was interesting mm. when I joined uh, Remax West in 2018. So that was another little like bond. And then, you know, we were like hanging out and we were friends, but right. it wasn't anything as close as what it is today since the pandemic. And we started with the podcast. Like it's been, you know, our relationship's pretty, you know, strong. He's my friend and I see him and talk to him all the time. And it's been because of the podcast every single week, we're always bonding over that. Kind it's of like stuff, forced right? friendship. It's like me and Steve, we talk anyways, but this podcast is like, it's our weekly date. We get to see each other yeah. and, and yeah. see what's going on. Right. So by the way, you mentioned, uh, Daryl became a goalie in his forties. I was a goalie my whole life and goalies are just a little bit weird. They're just, I, I can say <laughs> it because I'm one of them. So yeah. now, now it's all starting to make sense. It was decent. You know, like it was men's league. It was like, D division or whatever, yeah. but like he, he held it up, you know, we won some games. He was okay. Yeah. So, you know, people, he watched his daughter practice, I guess enough. People used to tell me all the time. They're like, you're pretty normal for a goalie. I'm like, I'm not sure if that's like uh, an insult or like, you're actually giving me a compliment here. Yeah. Um, okay. It's so brave. it's a brave it, position. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you want but to hang on? Let's, let's talk a little bit about why, again, the sh your show has been successful. It's because you probably talk more like real people. Than, is there anything worse than a real estate podcast where it's like being in a listing presentation, right? Yeah. Where it's just like, done those no... too. we're not perfect. We've had, we've had moments where you're like, Oh, this is tiring. Right. But I get you're, it. I know what you're saying. You, you totally. So it's, it's nice that you guys talk like real people. I think, you know, real people use objective language often. And that's obviously comes from <laughs> certain guests that you have or certain hosts, I guess you guys should have, but it's nice and refreshing to like listen to somebody talking about the market that it feels like you're at, a party, maybe over a couple of drinks and you're talking about the market as opposed to the buttoned up BS that most real estate podcasts are. Mm -hmm. they, I, 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 tol I totally agree. Go ahead, Tom. I was just going to say, I think the one thing that if you look, if you, if you look back at like, okay, who's doing podcasts on a, on a big level right now in terms of actually having viewership. And I talked about, you know, what Soretsky's doing, what Fosha is doing, what you guys are doing, what we're doing is, but we've made a, po most real estate agents that make podcasts, make podcasts for other real estate agents. They make them for the industry. And I think the difference in why ours have grown is because, yeah, of course we know real estate agents listen to our podcast, but it's, mm -hmm. we made this for consumers. We want to educate people on what's going on, not just boringly talk about real estate stuff with each other. We, and I think you guys, and also having Daryl where he was around the industry. 
but wasn't actively selling, I think makes yours yeah. very unique because Daryl openly is like, I don't like real estate agents. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's an interesting perspective to have on a show. 100%. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with both of the things that you guys are saying. And that's exactly what we try to do. And I think that the value, Tom, to, just to give you some credit here too, like I, I knew about you a long time ago. Like, I don't know if it's five years ago or, or more, but like I knew about your channel and that I'd, I'd heard your name in the city and stuff like that. And I knew that you were doing YouTube and, and everything yeah. else. But I think more so today is um, online entertainment has been where people are going to get it. I mean, do you guys remember um, every Saturday morning watching something called television when you were young? Oh, yeah. That was pretty cool, right? With those Steve, Steve, did they have TVs when you were that age? Hey, you want to know how old I am? I don't know how old he is. I'm assuming he's probably <laughs> older 30, than I'm 37. Lives. I'm 37. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're doing all right. Um, all right. When I – we used to watch Saturday morning TV – I, we had the the knob with the like thirteen channels that you turned around. Actually, it was like was it, it was like twelve channels, and then there was an extra one that wasn't a channel, and you just spun that thing. Yeah, so that's how old it was, Tom. You used I've to have to go before. to the TV. Used, Tom, Tom used never have... used those ones before. They were at never, my house, so I still had a chance to to pop them on. But uh, no, but I remember the TVs. Used, I remember right? the, the TVs TV. that you. It was, you, it was normal. Yeah, you and you turn it on, and you could there. hear. <laughs> you could hear, hear that you that like nee sound those old TVs yep. that that's yep. what I remember from my childhood. You, you, you were interested. You were like, wow, you know, like TV, like just like you, you can't work all day. You can't, um, you know, work out of the gym all day. You can't eat all day. You can't like talk to other people all day. Like you yep. need a time for your brain to relax, where someone's just inputting information into your head, where you just you can shut everything off. You can sit down, lie down, walk, run, whatever it is, but you're getting inputted information so that you're not actually having to use too much brain power. And so having podcasts and YouTube channels and everything else like that has been what's on the rise. And this is what people are doing lately. So I know that not every second of our show is great and it's not as informative. I think you guys do a much better job as information because you can get to the point and you're not distracted by Daryl and everybody else who's just you know, <laughs> trying to change the subject every 30 seconds. But, um, you know, this is what people need. It's, it's, it's actually a genuine uh, need in society is to be able to have some sort of input coming in from an external source. It gives people a break and they choose podcasts. And so there's a huge yeah. market for it. If somebody is looking at starting their own podcast, do it, start now, you'll get better at it, grow it, talk about anything you want to talk about. It doesn't have to be real estate. It can be any topic. And there'll be people who are going to find your natural conversation to be entertainment uh, and, and peaceful to listen to. I found mm -hmm. that. Uh, sorry, Steve, go on. I was going to say, and TK, what I appreciate being an agent in listening to, to your show is you can tell when you speak, which you get spoken over most of the time, I'm sure by your co-host, but when you speak, you can tell that you actually have a deep knowledge of the industry and your and the inner workings of things like a contract or different types of, of real estate. Like I do residential resale only, right? I don't get into development and all that sort of stuff. But you can tell that you have a deep understanding of what's going on. And I'm not sure that everybody listening can understand that you have that deep insight because they don't also appreciate the, the the little things you're saying that I can tell you know exactly what you're talking about, right? Yeah. So I think that attracts a lot of people to listen on the side note of, you know, having the entertainment value of what you obviously do. Yeah, th thanks for saying that. I mean, I, I nobody knows it all. And I think that's the thing that I've learned, you know, especially after joining uh, Frank Leo on the team, which I'll talk about a little bit as well, too. Like, you know, nobody knows it all. There's no agent, there's no broker, there's no team leader, there's no investor. Everybody's on this learning journey together. And so, you know, it's just embracing that and, and just trying to, you know, learn one new thing each and every deal or each and every week or problem that you have to solve. And you end up knowing more. I mean, egos get in the way when people think that they know everything. You stop yeah. learning and, you know, you, you rub shoulders with people the wrong way. Um, and then if you you are maybe shy and you think, oh, well, I don't know a lot, I'm new or, or whatever, then you also, you know, impact your growth and, and it affects your confidence and stuff. So you got to really know and understand that nobody knows it all and just go out there and, and be your best self and uh, get deals done and you can make it happen. So can you tell can you tell us a little bit about like the team and like because you joined a team, you're not an individual agent like a lot of the people that we have on. Yep. I'm probably the only team member you've probably had on. 
everyone else would own a team or they'd be an individual agent, right? That's that's the typical path of people who I are, would have to go through the Rolodex. For the yeah, most part, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? Like it's a pretty normal yeah. situation, right? You start off as an agent. I started off as an agent, so 2007. Uh, my dad was, a, my dad's still in the business, so he's been in the business like 40 years, right? So I had no. somebody when I first got in, my first week of real estate, I, I just got my license. My dad stuck me at an open house and he said, hey, go and, and show the open house. I'm like, well, what do I do? He's like, just open the door. Like, don't worry about it. Just <laughs> people come over. It's like, tell them here's the, the feature sheet and point them to where the bathroom was. So I was like, I can do that, right? I'm like 21 at the time and um, did not want to like take life seriously yet at this point. And uh, so I, I did the open house and um, a guy comes in, he's an agent, right? And he's like super pushy. The price was listed for 300,000 in Scarborough and on Peace Drive. And uh, so the guy's telling me, he's going, you know, we want to buy this house. My clients really like it, you know, like stop the open house, da, 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 da. like we want to bring you this offer right now. And I was just like, the hell are you talking about? Like I'm here till four, I'm following the instructions. Uh, I, I got to do, I don't, I don't even know if I had a cell phone at the time. I'm sure I did, but I was like, it's going until four. And I said, the sellers will be back and you're more than welcome to like come and bring the offer at that point. I probably told him he can come and talk directly to the sellers at that point. Cause I had no idea what I was doing. And so I, I got a hold of my dad and I told him and I said, look, this is what's happening. So the sellers get there and, um, the guy's like screaming and yelling because he wants to like negotiate. And the sellers had apparently just dropped the price from 325 to 300. They're like, we're not dropping a dollar. It's 300,000 or you get no house whatsoever. And the guy was tough. It's like the 70 year old man. He was tough as nails. And I'm just sitting there going like, I don't know what to do. My dad's calling every 30 seconds, making sure everything goes okay. And so finally my dad calls and says, uh, what, what's their best offer? And it was 299, 500. And so my dad said, tell them we'll take it out of the commission and get the deal done and tell the seller it's a done deal. So I said, okay. So I got it all signed up and I made zero dollars. <laughs> and that was my first deal. <laughs> and I was so happy because I got that experience to be able to go through something like that to put a deal together. And like those little things are so uh, underrated. Like you really have to, you know, go through a lot of different things there. And everyone's trying to make money and they're greedy and they're thinking about all the different things. But experience means more than anything else. And you know? TK, I think this can be said for every industry, but I find it kind of amusing sometimes where agents that have never been on a team structure that join a team and, and it's like a team that gives them opportunities and business. They're like, oh, this is great. This is just, you know, I just is great. This is so easy. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it's like being on your own, waking up, looking at your phone, like, what the hell do I do? They, I don't know who to talk to. Real estate's such a lonely business at the beginning. Those are the agents that truly appreciate it when they join a structure that's taking care of things for them or a brokerage that takes care of things for them. But I think that was really valuable to you, right? Like actually doing the things you need to do as an agent on your own before linking up and having more resources. Exactly. And and literally making $0. Yeah. But there was, there was a lesson I got from that that gave me other opportunities in the future, right? And so for about uh, 10 years, so I had you know a good business. I was down on the Danforth. I was at a home life office. Yep. We were um, a uh, reasonable size brokerage, you know, not tiny, but definitely not one of the big guys. Um, I was, uh, I had my own team for about five years. So I had, you know, six people. We, we mm -hmm. did really well. We were always producing. There was no, no issues there. And then 2017 happened. 2017 is when the market changed. And it was like everything totally shifted. And all the things that I used to do that used to work were no longer working, right? Where I was lowering the price. I wasn't selling houses anymore. They would expire. The sellers would be mad at me because I couldn't get them their price. There's a lot of stuff similar to the carnage we saw last year that happened in 2017 um, in our in our market, right? When the, the B20 measures came in on April 21st. So I actually had joined Remax West the beginning of that year because my brokerage sold. They changed hands. I got sold with the brokerage. Uh, it was like a deal where I came with the brokerage, but I had to stay there for a year and the new owner was a jerk. He eventually bankrupted it. And so I was out the door at a Remax West office because it was the closest office to my house. Not, not for any other reason. Just <laughs> I love that you're being honest about that. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, great, that's convenient. I could walk there. Right. Yeah. And so, and so I, then I got exposed to Frank Leo. They kept saying Frank Leo, Frank Leo. And I was yeah, like, yeah. listen, I don't think Frank Leo knows who he's talking about here. Okay. I, I'll teach him a few things. <laughs> and, uh, in that year, 2017, my business got crushed. Like I had like the sales difference from 2016, which is like a record year to 2017 was like less than half. Mm. So it was like a big change for me. And, um, he was the number one individual in the world for Remax out of 120,000 agents. So I was like, mm, maybe this guy knows something that I don't mm -hmm. know. 
right? So I met with him in 2018 and I said, look, what can we do? At that time, there was no agents in the East End. All of his agents, there was like 20 something of them. They all lived in the West End, Etobicoke, Vaughan, Mississauga. And I was the only one. I live in like the furthest Eastern part of the city, Steve, like as far East as you can go. And so it was like an opportunity that I thought was, you know, worthwhile looking into. And um, I had a friend who was a lawyer and so he, owned, you know, he's a defense criminal lawyer and he's owns a partner in a, in a law firm. And I know that he told me that he wasn't a named partner, right? And he still gets treated like a partner, but it's not his name on the letterhead. And I had a good conversation with him. I said, look, what's, what's that like, you know, going into meetings where you're not the name, where it's not, you know, your last name and whoever, um, how does that feel? He says, the only thing that matters to me is that I bring home the check to feed my family at the end of the day. And as long as that envelope is full of money, when I get home at the end of the day and everything's working out, he says, why do I care if my name is on the letterhead or not? Right. And in our case, it would be the name is on the sign. And so I thought long and hard. And I said, the opportunity I think is huge. It's bigger than what I think I could do on my own. And I was right. Mm -hmm. And and so I joined in 2018 and uh, I've been there ever since. And I, I plan to stay here for as long as possible. Like it's, it's a, it's a high level real estate. So I'm getting to do what I like to do. And I only have to do the fun stuff, all the things that, you know, we don't like to do. I, I, I don't have to be a part of. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been great. It's been a good experience. Cause that's where Steve came from as well. Right. Same, mm -hmm. same, what, same thought process, Steve. Like, when I first, when I first uh, started in the business, I ate shit for a year and a half. Right. Like it was terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually was like doing the part-time thing, making another income, that sort of stuff. But then I joined a team and about a year, probably a year and a half, two years in, things were going really well, joining onto the team. And then I had somebody come to me in the office, one of these old timer guys that does, you know, two, three deals a year. And he's like, I don't get why you do it. Like you're splitting up, like usually whatever the splits are, half your commission, whatever. Like, why are you doing all this work for half the money? Mm -hmm. And I just basically, I stopped and I was like, you know what, this, I don't know why, like, this is going great for me. So I don't understand what the problem <laughs> is. And I just, I just thought like, listen, you want your whole pie and I only get a slice of the pie, but your whole pie is a little, mm. a little, a little uh, baby pie, you know, cupcake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And now my pie is a Costco sheet cake and I get a, a piece of that. Right. So that's basically the way it broke down, the support and everything else. And now having switched in, in late 2019, I switched and bought the team and switched to a team leader. Cool. Let me tell like you, it is, a di it is a different Talk about thing. that more later. Yeah. Tom, Tom and I were actually having a conversation. I don't know how, I uh, probably shouldn't, on the podcast about actual like expenses and stuff, but we mm -hmm. were breaking down expenses and what it takes to be profitable in a market like we just came out of. Yep. Mm. It, like it's, it's scary for a while. And mm -hmm. now, thankfully, uh, the market has turned around and things are moving again and people realize that the world didn't end. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it really changes your perspective getting into that role. And it sounds like you almost almost went a little bit in reverse of that, right? Like you did it on your own and then you were like, you saw the benefits of, of joining with someone. And I jo got to join with someone very, very early and now I've been kind of pushed up the ladder basically. Yep. Um, the only problem with the ladder is there's only one way off the top of it, right? <laughs> Sell. <laughs> Sell to the guy underneath you. Apparently that's what you do. Yeah, keep it going. Right? So, yeah. So you get, you get again, pushed off the top. No, no, no. That's, that's, that's awesome, Steve. And I think that that's exactly like, there's nothing wrong with that journey. My journey terms, like real estate is just so diverse and you just have to find out what, what makes you happy. Exactly the same philosophy as in podcasting. It's identical. Mm. Yeah. What is going to make you get up every single day to eat, sleep, and breathe real estate? Whatever that is, if you're on a team, if you're if you're selling condos, if you're selling luxury, if you're doing leases, if you're doing commercial residential, I don't care. Whatever it is, you can be successful at it as long as you're going out there every single day and that you're passionate and that you want to do it. It, it works. There's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. In almost every single I do a lot of like brokerage trainings on on different topics whether it's like, you know, working with sellers or video stuff and and I say the same thing. I'm like if I don't care if you don't wake up excited about what you're going to do today, I don't care how many homes you sell. I don't care how much money you make. Like if you're miserable, what the hell's the point? We're here on this earth for like a finite period of time. What do you, what, who are you trying to prove this to? Like, does, if it makes you really happy to work your ass off, ass off 24 seven, by all means do your thing. But if you're just doing it just to do it, like I, I don't understand. It doesn't, it makes no sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Like and I, that's, and that takes, that's experience. That's wisdom. Those are all the things that, uh, you know, come up. 
I, um, you know, it's funny <clears throat> as I grow up, right. And, uh, you know, I have two kids and, you know, there's all this advice that my mom used to give me. Right. And I used to think, oh man, she's just bugging me. You know, I just can't believe she's always telling me what to do. Right. And then as time goes on and you have children, then you start giving the same advice to your kids. And then all of a sudden you're going, oh man, my mom, she really knew what she was talking about. Right. And, uh, it's those type of things that, you know, wisdom that you, you don't have, um, my dad too, as well. I'm using the mom example actually, because I had the uh, privilege and honor to talk one time with Tom's mom. And, you did. Uh, you did. Me, yeah. And she was like, hey, you know, I'm Tom Story's mom. <laughs> like first thing right <laughs> off the bat. And I was like, you, like, she just sounded so sweet. And knowing Tom, like, I'm like, she must be like, you know, a really sweet lady and stuff. So we talked for a bit and, and, it, and it was a nice little interaction and hopefully we can work together in the future. And just for and, reference, my mom works with me on, she's a real estate agent. Yeah, <laughs> That's so like estate, my mom just called agent. DK. <laughs> yeah. Like as far as I'm concerned, based on that one short phone call, she's the second best mom on planet earth. Like 100%. Well, I would, I would, uh, yeah. you know, I'm not going to say I agree. I agree. She's the best mom, but anyway, yeah, she's number um, one in your world and she, she can be number two in mine. Right. So yeah. keeping with parents for a second, cause parents yeah. give us our legal names. Is it public knowledge what TK stands for? Yeah. What does yeah, yeah. TK stand for? Stand for? Ta- it stands for Taylor Keith. Uh, it's, um, I'll give you the whole story. So it's my, my dad's name's Keith and, uh, he was, uh, the 11th son born to my grandmother in Ireland. And so they run out of names over there and she looked over on next to her table. There was a bottle of Taylor Keith and it's a pop and it's a, it's a pop in Ireland, right? You can get, I got some upstairs in my house. Yeah. And so she was like, oh, I got, got, got to name this one, I guess. So she chose Keith because it was on the bottle. And so my dad told that story to my mom. And so my mom said, well, that's a great name. And um, we'll call our son Taylor Keith. And even the pop no longer is advertised as Taylor Keith. It's just TK. And I was called TK from like a baby like i was always just tk no one's ever called me taylor keith unless i was in trouble yeah and uh, or like you know uh i'm in jail i've never been to jail but you know what i mean <laughs> a, a supply <laughs> teacher in school is reading off the sheet and yeah yeah, yeah 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 exactly so yeah. those type of things but other other than that it's always just been tk and um yeah i mean i i like my name i don't know okay well taylor keith i got some real sure. estate questions for you let's do um, it um okay so now uh, this episode, I believe, Steve, may actually be coming out on Mother's Day. Uh, if I, I'll, I'll double check on that, but I'm pretty sure well, it is. Is it bad that I don't know? What a perfect Mother's topic! Day is? <laughs> <laughs> it's Mother's Day is on a Sunday. It's I yep. believe the 14th. I believe that's when this is coming out. I'm I'm 98 sure. Um, I will okay. verify. I I believe it is. Okay, so the market is heating up. Okay, things are happening again. I even had a Bloomberg reporter call me yesterday and do an interview, and he's like, you know, I've talked to Benjamin Tal. I've talked to all the economists and none of their models make sense of this. They can't yeah. figure out what the hell is going on. Now, when we make these comments or make YouTube videos and update people on what the numbers are doing, some people don't like the numbers and that's okay. We can't change what the numbers are, but there's always something coming in the future that's going to change this, right? So it was, we'll just wait till the mortgage deferrals are out. Wait till everyone hits their trigger rate. There's always going to be a, a something that we're, we're waiting for, and then it's going to be bad. So the current thing is one third of Canadian mortgage holders have amortizations over 30 years. How does this end? The renewal crisis. The renewal crisis. I love your opinion on, because <laughs> this is the thing now that this is the thing we're being told, we'll wait till that happens. Yeah. Is it a nothing burger like all these other things, or does this actually have legs? <laughs> <laughs> so I am not the best person to talk to because I was saying that the mortgage default, mortgage um, deferral yeah. uh, crisis was BS. I was saying the trigger rate is BS yeah. and I'm going to call BS on this one too, Okay, but not because I know anything, but only just because <laughs> like, I'm not saying like, oh, this is why or anything like that, but just because I've been right the other two times. And so I'm going to bet that I'm going to be right again on this time. But anything can happen, Tom. The government has proven time yeah. after time after again that they are in control. Right. And, you know, in, in, in economics, you know, like all other things being equal, then yes, if everyone needs to renew their properties at a five to five and a half percent interest rate over the next 12 months, then there will be more inventory coming to the market. hundred percent. Mm. Which we desperately need. Sure. Um, did but, you see that? Did you see the numbers in April? Like I wanted to go over them with yeah, you. Give me the sure, but first sure, before we sure, do the, that. But, but the bank recently has made those decisions, obviously in, in line with what OSFI and everything is allowing them to do to be able to extend people's amortizations, which a lot of mortgage people don't even know about. I was talking to someone recently and the mortgage broker hadn't even, I had to send him an article just to prove it to him. Mm. Okay. 
what what other cards do they have? What other what other tools are they going to use when the time comes? Because the banks are protecting themselves. They right. don't care about mom and pop losing their home. They care about twenty percent of their book going underwater and going power of sale. That's that's billions of dollars for them. So they're going to use every tool as they can, and they'll pump this market, which I believe is going to give people an exit strategy. I think there's enough demand out there. Last night, three um, offer presentations we had. A uh, total of 20 offers, 12 offers, and two offers. 100,000 wow. are asking, 200 something, 300,000. Yeah. Like, there's so many buyers lining up right now. So, we yeah. uh, there's enough buyers out right now to to satisfy any increase in inventory that I think could happen. Um, again, what is the bank going to do? That's the question, Tom. I, isn't it interesting that we are in a market right now that if, if a few power of sales did come to the market, we're almost in a position where a power of sale could be getting 15 offers on it. Which is so weird because you think, oh, if it's a power sale, there's something going bad with the economy. Uh, not not in a general term, but if, if a lot yep. of them are happening, but then you yep. got 15 people lining up. Now, the numbers came out for April for the Toronto Real Estate Board very, very recently. And I looked at them this morning and from January until April, if you just go average sale price, all property types, we are now up 11% in four months. Yeah. So sh I'm shocked. I like you, me, Steve, we do this every single day. And even I was like, yeah. wow, what's going on here? Detached yeah. homes are up 20%. Condos are up like 7%. Townhouses were 7%. Semis were doing well as well. Like across the board, we're seeing increases. And I guess the question is, is this just a regular spring market? Let's pretend 2020, 2021, 2022 didn't happen. We're going back to 2019 times where things were just kind of moving along, right? Or is it is it back? Yeah. Is it back? And now we're going on a rip again because I don't think that's good either. Yeah, yeah, I to I totally understand, and it, and it's a great question, and I think it's like what everyone wants to know. But there's just so many factors when it comes to why a real estate market does what it does, and when people are are there, there's demand. When we had 30 offers a year ago, 29 people didn't get a house. Yeah. So there's 29 people who are still out there saying, "I want to buy." And so you have all these people who are saying, well, how much is the house where, you know, how much do I need to pay? And there, and there, we are seeing more activity in the lower price points. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, it isn't like it's back. There is nothing back. There is no $2 million houses selling. That should only be 1.6. Like none of that stuff is happening right now. Agreed. That's what everybody should know about. Yep. But yes, there are a lot of um, houses that are selling for more money than they would have in January. We're starting to see a, a pressure back on house prices, especially under a million dollars. It's mm -hmm. in the right neighborhood between one and two. You might see an increase, an increase in activity. Maybe there are some higher end homes that are selling right now as well too, but not for prices that anybody's like blown away with. And so Agreed. most of the things that we're seeing right now is aggressively priced homes and that people are saying, oh, let's, I can don't have to value the home anymore. I don't have to do a proper CMA. I'm just going to list it low and bring in a bunch of offers and let the buyers tell me. But and that, that strategy only works when there's limited inventory, right? Buyers won't play that game if there's lots to choose from. And the year-over-year -year numbers for April was that our inventory of new listings was down almost 40%. Where are the sellers? Why aren't the sellers coming? To, like, I've got my own theory, but mm -hmm. why do you think the sellers aren't coming to the market? What's the, the hold on? So everything's delayed. Nobody, like, we're the experts. We're the ones dealing with this every single day. We know what's going on. The public doesn't. Yeah. They're months behind. When By the time I show up there and I'm talking to them about what their next move is, they're, they're never on the ball like I am that week. What was in the news? Where are the sales? What happened? They're months and months and months mm. away from where we are today. So the sellers right now are still thinking that the market's actually not that good. When I'm uh, yeah. meeting with them right now, they're saying, oh, man, I heard the market's down. I heard it's not a good time to sell. And I'm like, well, why don't we talk about that? And what, what's your definition of good, right? You know what hasn't happened to me in a long time? I had a listing presentation yesterday and they're like, this is the price that we want to sell for. Like we can't sell for a penny under that. I'm like, I can get you 50 grand more than that. And I'll tell you what, that has yeah. not happened yeah, <laughs> in yeah, yeah. like 12 months, right? Steve, yeah. Are you seeing the same thing? Like uh, your market, are, are you same similar numbers to what we're seeing here? Yeah, we did. I was just negotiating a deal last night and the agent, you know, market's down and all this. Get, I love when people say comparables over. Yeah. All the comparables were sent to me between, let's say, January 1st and February 2nd. Yeah. And, and I'm like, that's cool. And then I looked at the stats and 
you know, Surrey detached homes in this particular area were up $105,000 since January. Wow. Right. And it's just like, send that back and be like, okay, here's the, here's the March sales. Yeah. And yeah. they are a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars $150,000 higher. So we are seeing that, that I priced a home. Uh, we, I guess we can talk about it now, Tom, uh, we alluded to it on a previous episode, but like I priced a home in March, we didn't bring it on, I think for three or four weeks. Uh, we went, brought it to market. I had to put a direction of offers on it, TK. Uh, so because the interest was got so crazy so quickly mm -hmm. and um what i thought was listed at a maybe we'll take a little bit under it ended up selling for more than one hundred and sixty thousand dollars over wow right so it was like and that was the difference between pricing it in march and bringing mm -hmm. it to market in april yeah and those think, are all the stories that we're, we're experiencing too like i think it might be as simple as similar to the buyers that were hanging on the sidelines before that were very, but when I'm talking about people that were thinking about doing it, that were consuming real estate content and reading the headlines, the average seller that's thinking about it is reading the one-off news headline. And they've been told for the last 12 months, the market's not good. It's, a, yeah. bad, it's, not, it's not a good market. Sale, sales numbers are going down. Prices are going down. They're seeing the year-over-year -year numbers where we were still down 8% year-over-year. Trigger, trigger rate, trigger yeah, rate, trigger rate. Whatever it is, they're being yeah. told it's bad. And it's like this weird thing where then that stops them from coming to the market. For the first time in April, I looked at some headlines today. There were some actual positive headlines of like, oh, actually, we have to acknowledge the data now because it's mm -hmm. actually looking like there's a chance we bottomed here, guys. Like we've had four I months... Think yeah. If I look at the van, I don't have it up right now, but I think the Fraser Valley board for April, there were more homes sold this April than last April. And that kind of makes sense because makes last sense. April was kind of the beginning of the down. We're gonna turn right? we're gonna turn the corner soon. Those those numbers for April and May and June are, are gonna start looking really different, right? That was 14% year over year declines aren't there anymore. And so the news is gonna have to report it. And to Tom's point, they love reporting on negative negativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what sells. They can't wait to be able to put up that bearish report to be able to get people to click on their news, news articles. And it's tough you, for them. To TK, get you want to know what viewers. we do for our videos? We cut and paste for our, like our main channel videos. We cut and paste headlines from credible uh, news, credible news sources yeah. uh, because their clickbait titles are amazing. Yeah, they're paid they to write those. Fantastic. Mm. They can yes. write them better than any, uh, you know, chat gpt ai youtube stuff right like they're amazing yep. and they get clicks because they scare people yep so that's that's something that we've noticed too is our, our some of our biggest videos have been an article that we were talking about that was major news cbc marketplace you know mortgage fraud or recently uh state fuel homes had, had a had a little bit of an issue there so those ones seem to get a lot more views because there's not just the regular viewers, but you're going to get a bunch of people who are also actually searching those terms and they're going to, the algorithm catches it. Right. And, and you guys do quite well with uh, a few people that I would consider to be a little bit on the exuberant side of things. Uh, yes, and I'm going to commend you. I'm going to yes. commend you. Uh, guests, commenters, yep. viewers, I'm sure. I'm yeah. going to commend you. I really appreciate the way you handle it because I am not of that <laughs> ability. I, yeah. I cannot sit there uh, across from the table of someone who I think is either very misguided or possibly fundamentally lying. And I cannot mm -hmm. have a polite conversation with them because I have to be right as well. Right. So I do commend you at you are very good at letting them have the conversation uh, go in a direction of where I think you point out who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't know what they're talking about by not saying much. Yeah, I mean, I do understand that I'm not right all the time and that there's plenty of things that I don't know. And I think that's always the first step. And so I agree with you. There's many, many things that have been said on the show from guests that is completely 100% ass backwards. But at the end of the day, you know, it's just about like having a conversation. People really should hear all the sides, should hear what people want to talk about. And, and it does get views. Like, you know, I, I'm not trying to prove a point with a show. I'm not trying to like, you know, have some sort of propaganda on what I think people should do with the market, even though people think we're here to pump and, and to do all this stuff. That really doesn't matter to me. My business is separate from YouTube and the market is separate from the media. It's, it's you know, the market's the most powerful thing in the economy 
the market decides nobody can control it nobody can dictate it nobody can predict it it will do things that you don't think it'll do it'll think it'll do things exactly the way you think it'll do there's no telling what you can what you can get from it or what you will get from it so, i take it as a huge compliment that anyone believes that me you steve daryl jordan you know Soretsky, anyone has enough authority to actually change the market like right? yeah even the biggest channels and i'm going to add nolan to that as well even the mm -hmm. biggest channels on youtube that that seem to cap at 35 40 000 subscribers in terms of canadian focused real estate content that is a sliver of the people making decisions in the actual marketplace right like yeah. to think we actually have that type of of you know, changing people's opinions, maybe to a, a certain extent of the people that watch, but like, that's a huge compliment more than anything that you even think I would try to pump the market that, that I would have any impact on what people actually yeah. do. The, the numbers are 2% of people at most are actually going to be making a move that year. Yeah. So if you get 30,000 people to watch your show, only 2% of those people are actually doing anything. Not to mention that 30,000 is less than 2% of the population. So it's, it is such a small number of people that actually, but it's just the way people like to spin things. Now let's talk about things that did happen last year. Cause I'm getting crazy. So I got one, I told it on the show last time where somebody was buying a pre-construction home that was way more than they could afford. There was no spreadsheet that said that they could afford this. There was no private lender who would have given them the money to buy this. And they said, in order for me to be able to afford that property, I'll buy three more smaller oh my ones God. and I'll flip them before that one's built. So did that they I hear this move into it. Did a TikTok realtor tell them this? I don't know, but they're honestly, they're not bad people. They're no. not like, they just, they just, they got caught up in this and everyone was telling them that it works. And so their limited experience with buying those type of properties mm -hmm. was, was, evident and so they just went in blindly and at some point somebody said that this was a good idea and that they should do it and collected a commission even though it's pre-construction there's probably a in in-house sales agent somebody right right and um there's no solutions like i have no solutions for some of these people like i'm like i i, I can't even come up with the most creative way to be able to get other than just dumb luck that the builder like fails or like maybe you can go and light them on fire i don't know that, that could be that could that be is a not idea. a recommended that is not a l advice here at but all was, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, i don't know i don't clear. know what that's, else that's, the, that's a i joke. don't know what else right yeah uh so. you've been hanging around daryl a little too long there okay <laughs> i'm just saying those are the, those are the things that like you know you know, we have to deal with in this market. So there are some situations where people got really, really, really mm -hmm. bad advice a year ago. And that hopefully we don't see that again. Hopefully that, you know, those type of things will clear up. And now if the market does continue to rise, we're going to have a lot more educated buyers making really sound decisions who are not going to overextend themselves. And maybe they pay more money than they want, which value of the dollar is much lower today. So you have to pay more than, than you want. Incomes haven't kept up, but they're going to have a way to be able to finance it that, that they're comfortable with. Because, and even you had alluded to when you made the change in your career, it was because of what happened in 2017, where the tap was turned off for a period of time. We thought this was over and then it very rapidly did, did come back the next year. But there was four or five months there that were like, oh, I, I don't know what's going on. But mm -hmm. I think the consumer, you look back to, let's go at least 2008 until now. Really, other than the five months of down in 2017 until what happened last year, mm -hmm. it was pretty good. It, you buy real estate, you make money, you buy real estate, you make money, you flip it, you get the next one, you go, like it had worked for, maybe it's now a good thing that last year happened. Not that I want anyone to get in a bad financial position or get hurt or, you know, not be able to feed their family. That's not what I'm saying at all. But maybe the fact that it's happened more recently, where it now, at least the consumers are like, okay, that ha it could actually happen again. So now let's make more sound decisions where we're not just making silly decisions, buying out of complete FOMO. I totally agree. And unfortunately, there's going to be some people as, as casualties who, who have to suffer because of that. But I look at it, again, I'm a father, I look at the younger generations, I try to figure out like, how are we going to, you know, I, I have legitimate concerns about like the future of the country and, 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 you know, the economy and like how people are going to survive and live and everything else. Like we had it pretty good. You know, we had yeah. it pretty good growing up at the time that we did, we were able to be able to experience a, a reasonable 
uh, childhood and, and lifestyle growing up and you had uh, unlimited opportunities, you know, as you got into adulthood to be able to be successful. I, f I find like that's going to be really hard for the younger people and that they need to make really, really good decisions with their money and their time to be able to survive and to live a good life. And if you're not making those decisions and you're always just thinking, ah, oh, whatever, I'm not worried about it. We're going to have a lot of people living like well below the poverty line, which, you know, doesn't help for the sustainability of the country, right? And in that conversation, which, you know, we had uh, a lot of people in the comments on the Brad Lamb episode were saying like, okay, gr you know, great, he's been super successful, but he said he bought his first house for like, had to put like five grand down or something. Um, mm -hmm. And then when I when I bought my first condo, I've had people say to me like, yeah, but you bought your first place in 2015, and it only cost you 350,000, it's now 700,000. So mm -hmm. I wonder, in five years from now, are we just going to have that conversation again saying, you're so lucky it was only 700,000 when you bought it. 100% you are. 1.2 million. Because So that's yeah. that's my only kind of counter is like, are we not just repeating here? And, and it's yeah. not to say it's a good thing by any means. It's just, if immigration keeps up at this level, if interest rates stay at a point that people can afford them and, and unemployment rates remain kind of to where they are, it's not going to get better. It can't. In terms of affordability is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I, I agree as, as far as affordability goes, because affordability is not just prices, it's also incomes. Yeah. And that's what it is, is you don't have the ability to be able to pay for. So if incomes, again, here's, this is every, all other things being equal. This is, this is how it is. If somehow, you know, inflation really hits us hard for the next few years and incomes keep up. My, um, my, uh, my uh, mom's a, a retired teacher. And she, uh, happy Mother's Day, everybody. And happy Mother's Day, mom. <laughs> yes. I think, it's Mother's Day. I, um, I think it is. I heard, <laughs> might be. I heard that she, she told me that she got a 6% um, raise on her pension. Yep. My dad got it too. My dad was, is, yeah. my dad's a retired principal. He got an yeah. inflation raise on his pension. 6%, which is like no other pensions are getting 6%, right? So if obviously teachers' pensions are very uh, well funded, but yep. what I'm trying to say is there could be a major increase into income. So then therefore we could look back and say, oh, you, you got in at 700, you're so lucky because incomes have now changed. We just haven't seen incomes change for a very long time enough to be able to keep up with the rise of cost of goods and housing and everything else too. But things things change. Things change. That's what happens. And, and so we can't, we don't know what's going to happen with income. So we can't possibly say, what is it going to be like for affordability in five years? I can right. tell you right now that if income stay the same and house prices don't come down, affordability is not getting any better. Right? And have either of you thought about the fact, like you both have young kids. I've got a very young kid. Um, you know, are your kids going to be able to live in the, in the cities that you guys live in? Are you now going to try to set something up for them now because you have the knowledge of what could happen with prices that you want to at least kind of help them get started? Steve, do you want to start first and then we'll go back to TK? Oh, my kids will be, I mean, it'll be their choice, I guess, uh, outside of, you know, certain life choices. But I'm setting them up to, like, understand this is the way you're going to do it. You, the problem we have right now with the younger generation is they don't want to be tied to things. They don't want to be tied down. I was talking to a, a client. He is uh, retiring, selling his business, trying to sell his business. Nobody wants to buy his business. It's a very lucrative business. And he's got, it's a profession and he could easily sell it. And someone can make $500,000 a year taking over his business. And the reason that he has cited the people that he's interviewed to maybe take it over is they don't want to sign the lease for the, they don't want to be committed to that business for a three more years on the end of the lease. So I think that is everywhere. The number one objection I get is, well, what if we want to travel? Yeah. What if you want to travel? Well, go rent out the one bedroom apartment you should be in, right? Like you should be buying as soon as you possibly can the whatever you can afford at the youngest possible age, right? Like you got to be able to do it. And there's so many people that make excuses of why they can't do it. And going back to having Brad on, he was like, nobody's suffering. Nobody's going through. Like we did, TK, you mentioned, like we kind of came out of this Goldilocks generation. I think our parents were actually probably the ones that were in the Goldilocks generation. We're just coming out of that. But there was not enough suffering going on. I, I think back a generation before that, my grandfather in the war came to Vancouver after the war, bought a house, 
lived in the basement with his four children and his wife, rented out the entire upstairs because guess what? In 1954, it was unaffordable to live in Vancouver. So he rented, he actually rented to old, these old ladies, like kind of housekeeper nanny ladies. And each one of them had a bedroom upstairs. And the entire family lived in the basement until my dad was 15. And then when they moved upstairs, 14, 15, they moved upstairs. And then my dad, they closed in a porch and that was his bedroom. Mm -hmm. Right. So for, let's call it, my dad was born in what, 52? To, let's say so let's say from 54 56 whenever they moved into that house uh until he was let's say 15 years old so 10 years he's living in a basement one bedroom two bedroom basement suite with a family of six mm-hmm. and it sucks now how is it different we just came out of this zone where we expected it too much yeah. i think we expected too much good time what's that saying good times make uh soft men how does that thing go? Joe Rogan quotes it all the time. Yeah, hard yeah. times Good make, times make, make men, hard, hard, times. hard men something. We're, let's not quote it here because it's so terrible. But it's yeah, it's what we're coming out of. We're 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 coming out of a time where no one has had to struggle, and the struggle is. I don't want to say hopefully coming back because maybe that's not the right term. But I think people will appreciate things more if they can't afford them. Mm-hmm. So I think um, you're you're right in that sense is that things are are challenging and exactly to my point earlier is that this is going to be really good for younger people to be really cost focused on what do you really need do you need to go oh my gosh I had this one appointment and I met with them and I use this all the time and I said you know between now and you buy a house don't go and buy a Range Rover and she looked at me and she says I just bought a Range Rover <laughs> <laughs> it happens so often oh I better not use that one anymore right and it was you part removed- of- my office is parking lot. Yeah. Like, you remove like, conditions. Aisle, they shouldn't have owned a Range Rover, you know? Between removing conditions and closing on the house is yeah. often a car purchase, which totally screws your closing. Of and- course, yeah. This is like early stages. Of, we're just meeting. And I was just like, look, you know, kind of, and I was guiding them to prevent that exact scenario. And she had just bought a Range Rover. So people need to have that sort of blown into them. Now, social media is that like, there's all these new things these years. Is, is social media hurting chances because kids are watching all these wealthy people being successful at 21 years old? Total tangent here. All these ads that I'm getting right now on how to be able to sell real estate, none of the kids are over 22 years old yeah, who are yeah. running, it's pretty are running things. Yeah. It's like over and over again, real estate agents, are you struggling this year to make the GSI that you made last year? What if I were to tell you five confirmed booked appointments all in the next 30 days or else you yeah. don't pay? I'm like yeah. the same script over and over again. I'm just like, what the heck is going on? They all on? took the same course somewhere and they, they do the same loom videos to tell you your website sucks. And like, it's yeah. 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 So, it's so this is the sort of like, I deserve like the entitlement type of generation that I was hoping didn't exist. It seems yeah. like it's worse than ever. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's worse than ever and that my kids are going to be entitled, spoiled little brats. And I'm going to have to be able to like really teach them some hard knock lessons in order to be able to snap that out of them. And that parenting, I think, is more important today than ever before. And how do you do that though? Well, I mean, like I I got my older son, the 11 year old doing things right now already. So, I mean, you know, he's earning, you know, money around the house, doing little jobs for me, things like that. I, um, I'm planning on putting them in, under the, the business eventually to do different things so that he can understand, learn how to save. I got him buying a few different small investments. I, Bitcoin, when I was losing money doing that, I was showing him why I was losing money and how that is a horrible investment. But, you know, I was going through all those type of things to him and really just trying to educate him. I'm not the best at it. I'm not like going to claim that I've got it figured out, but I'm having conversations with them about investing and about how to manage money. Because if you don't, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. And they're, and there's gonna, they're gonna make bad decisions. And if they want to move to the states, if they want to move out of town, Tom's question was, do I see them moving and living in Toronto? You know, what, whatever, whatever makes them happy is 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 okay. Obviously, it's nice you want your kids close, but to me, it's more important that they would be like happy and 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 living a life that they're they're content with. And there is a lot of opportunities in Toronto, but there's also a lot of other opportunities out there. So I wouldn't look at it as a failure if they can. When is- when is the last time you guys went to a restaurant or a fast food joint? I'm not going to fast food joints because I'm trying to lose weight, TK. But um, <laughs> you went to one of those places and you saw like a, a 14-year-old kid behind the counter. Do you see that anymore? Because yeah. when I was 14, 15, everybody – no, not everybody. Let's Are say you, I don't think 
you can work of the there at 14. Had, you can w- legally work at 14. BC brought in a bunch of rules really? that says you can't work in a bunch of facilities until okay. you're 16 now because they view it as child labor, which I think is a joke. But there is there's a bunch of parents. Parents are the problem. Let's face it. Saying yeah. you know, oh no, I want my kid to be able to focus on on their studies or or have a good time or not have to work so hard like I had to work. No, that's the wrong way yeah, to do it. Right. We need right. to teach kids that guess what? You got to make your own way and it's going to suck for a bit. It's tough, it's tough at my house. I'm not going to lie. I, I pro- I'm probably too hard on my kids in a, in a lot of different areas, but like school, studying, you know, sports, uh, you know, learning about, you know, responsibilities at home. My 11 year old, what age is an appropriate age to start doing your own laundry, Steve? My kids both do their own laundry. Uh, what, they are they are six and eight. Are they turning on the machines and throwing in the pot, or are they just putting it in the basket? Uh, so no, I, no, no. Sorry, they're, they're folding and putting away. Okay, okay. okay. Mine at eight was doing the whole shebang. You okay. get a stool, you turn on the machine, you throw in the little soap pod, you put in your clothes. He screwed it up a hundred times before he got it figured out, and now he's one hundred percent, one hundred percent sustain self sustainable to be able to do his own laundry. And if he doesn't have clean clothes to wear, it's because it's his fault. It's his responsibility. You know, this is the type of stuff that is like, it seems simple making your bed in the morning, you know, making my, my older one makes the breakfast for him and his younger brother in the morning, all these type of things. I know it's, it's crazy and I'm tough. No, but no, Tom, I got to jump in here. You're, I know, gonna, I know what you're going to say. I, and I'm I trying have, to jump. No, no, you don't know what I'm going to say. You don't know what I'm going to say. Cause I'm going to okay. confess to something right now. TK, I'm going to confess to you. I shouldn't okay, say that. Won't share it with that. Won't yeah, we won't tell anybody. Don't nobody nobody repeat this. It's funny that you brought up laundry, because guess what I do on four uh, four p.m. Eastern on Sundays when uh, folding time. my laundry. Yeah, that's when I fold my laundry, and that's then the I plug thing. in my earbuds, and my family leaves me alone, and I listen to the Canadian real estate show while folding my underwear. So there you go, TK. I am so glad to have that image. <laughs> holding your, you know reasonable size underwear because you know you're looking good lately <laughs> in a nice neat pile because you're organized listening to the best show on sundays at 4 p.m on uh, youtube <laughs> well hey hey tk someone uh commented on one of our recent videos and said that you guys are a great um warm-up for the canadian real sh- real estate <laughs> show to come out so we're kind of like your warm-up act we, we get no. all the people excited early in the morning so if you're watching this and listening make sure because this is coming out early on sunday later yep. today there's going to be a new episode of the Canadian Real Estate Show that you should be checking out as well. Um, yep. I want to ask you something. So what I'm, I did some kind of research before we had this show. I actually do once in a while, you know, prepare for these shows. And I know that, that you're not just a dad. You're not just a real estate broker. You're not just the co-host of the Canadian Real Estate Show at Sundays at 4 p.m. But you are also very heavily into jiu-jitsu, correct? That's correct. Okay. So what I'm seeing from afar, right is a lot of the principles that you have, whether it's for your kids or maybe your calmness in which you you have conversations with people are going back to maybe things you learned in jujitsu. Cause I even, I creeped your Instagram yep. and, and I saw and all your Instagram posts are like you standing on the number one, like you won whatever you were in. And yep. one, one of the comments was like, I was there, congrats on your calm something approach to winning where I guess you weren't just like running at someone trying to like you're very like methodical do you take what you learn in that aspect of your life and bring it over to business and family 100 percent. like no no I'm not gonna like not admit that um I think there's a little bit of my my nature in there I don't think it's like all just jujitsu but yeah yeah jujitsu is a big part like I'm a lifelong martial artist like taekwondo muay thai boxing like my whole life I've been involved I've never been any good I've always just been kind of like consistent but there's always been a lot of people better than me. Um, so right now in jujitsu, you know, I'm at a certain level where there's lots of people below me, but there's also a lot of people above me, but it's based on age, weight, that kind of stuff. So uh, I got a tournament, um, well, technically Saturday, May 6th, which nice. this will be ready. So well, I'll let you know the results of that, what, what happens there. But, um, you know, I'm very average, like there's nothing special about it, but I'm definitely uh, learning a lot of different things about life itself by the challenges that you face in any sport, but you know, jujitsu is a combat sport. So it means like you're, you know, you got more on the line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you better be humble. You better learn from your mistakes. You better not think, you know, everything you better take your time. You better study. You better work hard. You better make sure that you're doing everything properly because if not, then, you know, it's your neck on the line. Right. Steve, you love martial arts. Uh, did you ever actually do any of it or just as no, a viewer? No, I didn't have the guts. I just about like right before lockdown, I was trying to get there. There's a jujitsu uh, gym just 
like three blocks from my house and I was getting up the courage to go and I chickened out because COVID hit and everything. I, I trust me, I want to. It's never um, too late, man. But there's there, there's no is. such thing as an age limit. There's no such thing as you don't need any experience. You just go in there and you humble yourself and you say, I know nothing. What do yeah. I, what's my first move? What's the, what's the next step? And, and there's yeah. so many people who want to help you. So my little, uh, my nephew takes yep. the classes there. Nice. And, um, it is interesting, Tom, when you let a 10 year old put you in a rear naked choke, <laughs> how, and he's like 75 pounds. He's a tiny yeah, kid. That, that age, it'll, it'll start working. Yeah. And when he laid into it, yeah, that is no joke. So I could only imagine, you know, putting a 175 pound man on your back doing the same thing that it humbles you pretty quickly. However, I am a big, does that translate to UFC fandom? For you, TK? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've, I've been watching UFC for, for, you know, two decades. But um, Are you excited well, as, uh, as I am to see the worst card of all time come to Vancouver UFC pay-per-view? Have you seen this? I, I look, I've looked at it a little bit, but I'm just happy that it's coming back to Canada because I'm hoping to be, like, I'd love to do another Toronto show, right? Like, that would be amazing to have another Roger Center sellout like that. Or I don't know where they would have it now, but, like... I'm excited for that. So, so I think the cards, they're, they're hard to be entertaining, to be honest with you. They are salty. It's a salty, salty, salty card right now. And I was yeah. like, you know what? I love, I've been watching UFC now probably since 2008. Like I'm, I, I really appreciate it. I, I, I'm a fight pass subscriber, everything, right? Like I'm, I'm in there. And I was like, I got to go see one live finally. Nice. So actually I reached out to a friend who I know has actually Keith Roy. I reached out to him, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I said, I know you have Canucks tickets. I know you can get me in on the pre-sale. Let me know. And he sent me a screenshot. And he's like, do you want these two tickets? Any any guess? Give me a guess. I know the whole range of tickets from ringside to the cheapest one in, in the whole place. So Where were these located? Lower Bowl? These are Lower Bowl good seats. Let's 600 say. per ticket? Probably 1,200 per ticket for something like that. It'd be like they 20 were, grand for like the ringside. The pre-sale mm. was uh, eight forty-five per seat. Whoa! Mm. The cheapest nosebleed there is in, and this is where the Canucks play, was two hundred and nineteen dollars. And ringside that I saw was twenty-one thousand mm -hmm. dollars per seat. So mm -hmm. I was like, you know, and you don't see anything, Tom, from a UFC like in the nosebleed. So I'm like, okay, well, that might be interesting to to go do that but i was like there's no way i can do a mortgage payment to go see this so i i guess we're i don't uh, way to write it off it's literally like my method for like anything that i do i'm like is this a business expense or not <laughs> <laughs> take a client yeah I'm, yeah i gotta take what? a client that's not gonna work that's gonna come out of like after tax dollars i'm not interested but if i can find a way to business expense it i'm a little bit more ready. and if it was a fighter i wanted to see but i don't think uh nunez who kills everyone versus pena as your uh, your main event is, is going to get there. Here's what I'm thinking. You know, YouTube boxing took off during the pandemic. All these all these young kids were boxing each other. We're going to get Steve into this, TK. We're going to do a Canadian real estate show versus Tom Story show, live jujitsu match. You Perfect. versus Steve. Perfect. Me versus Daryl and you versus <laughs> TK. <laughs> you know what? Don't worry about it like that, Steve. I really want you to go and try a class. And I'm looking forward to the next time that I talk to you, you say, TK, I went to the class. It was great. It was exciting. And like, you have nothing to be afraid of. Like, it's a really, really, it's actually, jujitsu means the gentle art. Like, it is a very, like, calm yeah. thing. Oh, it's fan fantastic. It. Um, so don't, I, I want to get there. I'm going to try and, I'm going to try and work it up. TK, my, I'm actually taking my no. daughter there. Uh, I Thank figure you. with, with having two girls, it would be probably good for them to know how to, how to put a guy in a triangle if they need to, yep. Yep. uh, in the future, that sort of thing. Right. So, uh, Huge I want to get there. Huge I'm gift. Not there I, yet. Gave, I gave my kids this gift and my son, who's now six years training, uh, you know, I'm not saying he's great or fantastic or he's going to be a world champion. I, I, I never even mentioned those things to him. I just consistency, go there, have fun, make friends, learn the lessons. And like, you wouldn't believe how many lessons I've seen him learn just from jujitsu alone in those, in those years. It's, it's a, it's a gift you give your kids. In my is opinion. this, is this a myth or is this true that if you get to a high enough level of these martial arts that your hands are considered weapons? Is that, is that just a myth? Is that just a made up thing I hear? Um, well, um, 
Chuck Norris, you know, when he crosses the border, right? He has to flash his <laughs> uh, license yeah. for each one of his hands every single time he gets pulled over. No, I no. do think, I do think jujitsu, if you have somebody, you put them in five, six years old and you let them train till they're 16, 17, That's there's good. a very good chance that is as close to a superhero as they're going to get. So incredible, Tom. You have no idea. Like when you feel what a kid who's been training like their whole life feels like and mm -hmm. they're like super tiny and whatever, you're just like, how does any kid their size like stand a chance? Like they would mm -hmm. just destroy a grown man. And so, but in a very nice, calm way. So, the kids <laughs> in the school, so imagine in the schoolyard, if the kid is like, oh, Tom was on top of me and he was, you know, da -da -da, and the teacher's like, well, did he hit you? No. Well, what did he do? Well, he got on top of me and then I couldn't get up. And, I, and I'm so tired and he's so relaxed. What's wrong with him? You know, like and the teacher's like, so, so he didn't hit you? No, but like he should be in trouble. Okay, well, you know, these guys play nice. <laughs> That's all it would take. You wouldn't have to do anything to someone. You'd just be able to hold them down and make them work really hard while you just relaxed. Who um, was it on the uh, – there's a video in Vegas of – oh, I can't remember who it Nate is now. Or Nate Diaz. No, it was a video. This is an older one. Uh, okay. And it, there's a guy in um, – uh, he was getting out of hand, and one of the UFC fighters, he literally just sat on his belly, grabbed his wrists – and and waited until yeah. oh, I'm trying to remember. Matt Sarah had a video Matt like Sarah, that. Matt Sarah, Matt Sarah, Matt Sarah. Yeah. yeah, and then the security guard comes over who is obviously not able to secure this guy. And yeah. Matt's like, are you sure you want me to get off this guy right now? <laughs> yeah. But the Nate Diaz one where he got attacked and put that guy to sleep in about four seconds was pretty amazing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let's so, uh, let's wrap this thing up. I want to I want to come back to to real estate for a second. Um, talking about inflation, wage inflation, UFC tickets inflation, everything inflation. There is something that actually may be causing inflation as well, and it's going to impact at least me and TK. TK, the Toronto Real Estate Board for the first time in twenty years is going to have a, a vote on May the seventeenth about mm -hmm. increasing our board fees. It's finally happening. I saw, I clicked on a video on the main page of the login, which I never do. I was like, oh my God, I know this was happening. Yeah. Um, is this good thing for the industry? We've been yelling for this forever. It's like, there should be like a minimum amount of homes you have to sell or make the fee higher so less people get in the industry. What are your thoughts on this? I don't, I don't have an opinion to say whether it's good or bad. I know that Treb does the best they can. I think that it's a, uh, it's an organization that, uh, you know, there's a lot of money. I think one of the things that I wasn't impressed with Treb recently, if I have my chance to complain was the fact that they would be considering privatizing, um, the MLS that to me would be an issue, right? Is that mm. if they take things private and similar to Zillow or, or anything like that, and things are going to be monetized now it becomes who is, who wants the most amount of attention. And so, you know, bigger teams will be able to dominate, you know, which are, it's good for us, I know, but um, that the board ends up losing sight of their mandate, which is to be able to help realtors fairly and that everybody gets an opportunity to be able to sell as many homes as they want and all that kind of stuff too. I mean, as far as the board dues, I'd really like to see the books to see why those board dues need to be increased. If it's just going to be a couple of hundred dollars, is that really going to deter right. anybody from getting their license? Probably not. I think for the most part, the people who want to be here will find a way to stay and the people who are not in this for the right reasons will be, eventually they'll be gone. Well, I don't, this is probably a whole nother episode on its own because you guys have had these guys on your show, but the Habistat just got shut down and that was a platform that I loved using and I have no idea exactly what happened. I don't want to speculate, but something probably with real estate boards is the reason why I can no longer log in and get actively very good data that can help my clients make decisions. But that is probably a conversation for another day. TK, this has been so much fun. I appreciate you being here. If you're watching this or listening to this and you enjoyed TK and you don't already listen to his show, make sure 4 p.m. today to go check out the Canadian Real Estate Show as well. TK, on the real estate side of things, um, how yep. can people reach out to you? What's the best way to connect with you? Um, usually the best way to get to me is just through, um, the show Canadian real estate show. You can contact me through, through there. I mean, I answer every comment, so I'm really easy to at least have a discussion with. Yep. If you want to, you know, look me up, you can look me up as armbar broker on Instagram. Um, and then of course, if you just Google my name, TK Butler, you'll see my, uh, office line and you'll be able to call me and talk to me and get in touch with me. No problem. That was great. I love that episode. I, I, I was really excited for you to come on and uh, and chat with you on, on the one-on-one -on -one perspective because we did it with Daryl as well. And yeah. uh, I think that was awesome. Steven, final thoughts? 
I just want TK to remember to picture me folding my laundry <laughs> when you're when you're recording your next show. Just remember that. I'm gonna picture you doing what we refer to as involuntary yoga, which is you folding other people's clothes with them still in them after your first few jujitsu class. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> involuntary yoga. Voluntary I like yoga. It. Yeah. All right. Thank you everybody for watching and listening. We appreciate you being here. If you haven't already, make sure to like and subscribe and give us a review on Apple Podcasts. My name's Tom. On behalf of Steve and our guest TK, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And we will see you next week. Bye. Bye, Tom. That was a great sign.